I want you to understand today that you've got what it takes. Whatever you have to deal with in life, you've got what it takes. And you need to renew your mind to that and stop thinking that you can't because as long as you think you can't, everything that comes along is going to overwhelm you and defeat you. Courage. Actually, the key to progress which really is change because nothing ever progresses unless it changes, is to understand the anatomy of fear. And when you feel fear, to be able to feel it but do what you know that God is asking you to do anyway. A little phrase that I use a lot is, do it afraid. It was a great revelation to me many years ago. I heard a story about a woman who'd lived her whole life in fear would not drive, would not go out at night, was afraid of meeting new people. It, just, it was pathetic what she'd lost through fear. And she was telling her story once again to another friend, hoping that friend could help her. And the friend looked at her and said, well, why don't you just do it afraid? It'll take you a while. It did me too. But see, the point is, is we wait not to feel fear. But the truth is, is courageous people feel fear all the time. They just do what they're supposed to do anyway. Amen. And so just because you feel fear does not mean you're a coward. We all feel fear. Everybody feels fear. Every hero that we read about in the Bible was afraid. Esther was afraid, but she faced her fears and she did what she believed that God was asking her to do. I've had times in my life when I've been so afraid, taking steps of faith that took me to the next level of my ministry that I can remember my knees feeling so weak that I felt like that I would fall down just trying to walk down the hallway in my home. It's only people who feel fear, move beyond it, and do what they know they're supposed to do that ever accomplish anything in life. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1. I don't know what you might be facing right now, but I can tell you that fear is going to try to keep you from having the victory. Fear is a spirit that produces feelings. But we have a will that can override that. I will not fear. That's the only acceptable attitude for a Christian to have. I will not fear. Why? Because God is with me. That's the only reason that we need to not fear. God is with me. He's greater than anything that comes against me. God gave Joshua a pretty big job. He was supposed to finish the job Moses started. It would kind of be like if I got in the middle of this message today and then just out of the clear blue called for one of you to come finish it. Now there might be a few of you that would think that was a good opportunity, but then there might be some of you that would just want to faint dead away in the floor. Well, Moses meant a lot to the people, but God didn't let him finish because Moses had... A temper problem. He had a problem with anger. And when somebody that's being used by God has a problem with anger and they refuse to get it under control, they become dangerous because anger is an emotion that causes you to do things that you shouldn't do and say things that you shouldn't say. So God took Moses to be with him. He loved Moses. He buried him himself. And Joshua had been Moses' minister and unbeknownst to him, had been in training to finish the job that Moses started. And so God said to him, Moses is dead now. You take this people and cross over the Jordan. And every place upon which the sole of your foot treads, that have I already given unto you. So God's already done everything that needs to be done in our lives. He's just waiting for us to take it. God is not going to give you a big blueprint for your life where you never have to take any kind of chances. Amen? But see, the truth is, is when you're reaching for that new thing in your life, now come on, you got to let go of this. God won't let you have this till you let go of that. And sometimes He won't even let you see it. He won't even tell you what it's going to be. 
So the reason why we feel like our lives are being ripped apart during change is because we normally want to hold on to this and then we want to try to <laughs> take hold of that, but we don't want to let go of this just in case we don't like this. <laughs> Come on now. And God always keeps it just far enough out of your reach that finally you're going to have to say, all right, I'm done with that. I'm investing that. I'm not going back. I don't know what God's going to do, but I'm going to be courageous enough to find out. Amen. And I've gone through that over and over and over in my life. Left my job at the church because I felt like God had called me to go north, south, east, and west. Nobody knew who I was. Where did I think I was going to go? So I went to North St. Louis, East St. Louis, West St. Louis, and South St. Louis. <laughs> Had a meeting once a month in each part of town. Went on eight radio stations, and here we are, 25 years later, traveling around the globe, ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> but I was scared. Do you understand? Scared. The first big meeting that I ever got to do, there was about 900 people, and I'd been believing God for years and years and years to get to speak to more people than just 25 at a time. And I kind of accidentally got invited to come and do this conference because they had a speaker that bailed out on them at the last minute, and somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody knew me. And so I wasn't even like a first choice or a second choice. I was kind of like a last-ditch effort, you know. And nobody knew who I was. Nobody. Nobody cared. And I got there, and here's Dr. So-and-so, and Reverend So-and-so, and Bishop So-and-so, and Reverend So-and-so, and Archbishop So-and-so, and Joyce <laughs> from Fenton. I'm telling you what. And I wasn't even doing a main session. I was just doing a little workshop. You know, like in one of the little off-the-beat rooms, you know, that it's like, it was no main deal. And so, but they asked all the speakers for the workshops to come up on opening night. It was like Friday night. And tell everybody what you were going to speak about the next day so people could choose what workshop they wanted to go to. Well, I was so scared that I opened my mouth and tried to talk and nothing came out. <laughs> now, you all know that I'm pretty good at talking, so... For me, not to be able to say anything was pretty major. And I felt like such a fool. I mean, the devil had demons sitting on both shoulders. Why don't you get out of here, go back to Fenton where you belong, and stay there? Who do you think you are? And I had a choice to make right then. And if I wouldn't have made the right one, I wouldn't be here today. I thought, I'm going to dig way down deep and try one more time. And I got my mouth open. And I told them what I was going to share about. And the next day, we had so many people in our workshop. They were hanging out the doors of my little room. And when it was over, they went and bought everything on our resource table. I think they would have bought the tablecloth if we would have sold it. Well, how many of you know when you go through that and then you have the victory, you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then you're so glad that you went ahead and did what you knew God wanted you to do. But I wonder how many people never get to that side of it because they give up somewhere along the way. So I believe here in Joshua chapter 1 when God begins to tell Joshua, this is what I've called you to do and the only thing I need you not to do is get afraid. And he, did, he wasn't telling him not to feel fear. I think he was actually telling him, you're going to feel fear, and when you do, don't you run. The word fear means to take flight or to run away from. And I believe that it's time to confront things with the courage of God because you cannot make progress. Nothing changes in your life unless you do something about where you're at. And sometimes you've got to leave the place you're at. Sometimes you've, you've got to change your attitude about the place where you're at. But it always takes change to make progress. You're not going to make progress and everything stay exactly the way that it is. And so he goes on here in Joshua 1 and verse 5 he says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses so I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. And I love that. He didn't say, now I want you to go be like Moses. He said, as I was with Moses so I will be with you. You see the key about hanging out with God is it doesn't really matter what you're not. I said, it doesn't really matter what you're not, because whatever you're not, 
he will be that for you. So if there's five of us up here and one has five talents and one has three and one of us only has one talent, but we've all got God, it doesn't really matter because we're all going to end up being victorious. Doesn't matter to God if he has to do one thing for you or 25 things for you. What matters to him is if you're trusting him. Verse 6, be strong, confident, and of a good courage, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only you must be strong and very courageous that you may do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it, for then you shall make your way prosperous, deal wisely, and have good success. Now the one thing that you need to do while you're trying to make progress is keep meditating on the word and speaking the word. Meditating on the word, speaking the word. Meditating on the word, speaking the word. He's telling Joshua you are not going to get where you're going if you don't make the word of God the center focus of your life. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong, vigorous, and very courageous. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. The key to peace, I just told you the key to change, is to move beyond fear. But the key to peace as things are changing in your life, and is to do what you can do and then not be upset about you, what, what you can't do. And while you're waiting on God to do the part that you can't do, to go ahead and enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going. Now, I'll say that again because I know you need me to. Amen? <laughs> See, there's things we can change and there's things we can't change. And I can stand here and deal with you all day and tell you be bold, courageous, and do this and do that and do something else. But just like all of us, you've got some situations in your life that you can't change. Only God can change them. And we spent all of Friday morning saying you have to do what you can do. And if you do what you can do, God will do what you cannot do. But he doesn't always do it when you'd like him to. Might as well be truthful. God's never late, but he's generally not early. And he doesn't work on our timetable. And he's really good at this whole midnight hour thing. Amen? And the whole reason for that is he's stretching our faith. Testing our faith sometimes. So we're going to do what we can do. But then we have to find some way to deal with what we can't do. And still enjoy where we're at on the way to where we're going. Because I would venture to say that in every life, in every season, there are some things that you can't control. How many of you got a few of those going on right now? Things that you just, and they just like, it's just so frustrating if you don't know how to handle it right. When I was a young child, and I was still being sexually abused by my father. If you've been through that, you know the pressure of it. If you haven't, just imagine a child having the responsibility of trying to keep that awful secret. And you're trying to live the life that you're living and nobody around you can know. And there's a part of you that wants to tell them, but there's another part of you that knows you're going to get in trouble if you do, or they may not believe you and so on and so forth. And so we would go to my grandmother's house semi-often, and she had a sign in her kitchen that really comforted me, which is kind of interesting to me because I don't even know that I was really old enough to understand it, but it's the one that most of you will be familiar with. I think we call it the, the serenity prayer, and it goes, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, we need to change what we can change. We need to 
accept what we cannot change. And when I say accept it, that doesn't mean that you still don't want it to change. It just means that you find the courage in God to come to terms with it until God does what you cannot do. And if you don't do that, you're not going to enjoy your life. Please listen to me today. You will not ever enjoy very much of your life if you do not find a way to do with that because not one of us knows on any given day when we get up exactly what we may have to confront that day. Amen? Yesterday while I'm trying to run this conference and got plenty on my mind, don't need nothing else, left the morning session, started getting phone calls from my daughters, my mother was in the hospital, and she just got out of the hospital. She'd been in for a long time, and then in the nursing home for like 30 days, and you know, I'm doing what I'm doing, but I also have my elderly mother and my elderly aunt that we take care of. Now, you know, if you've ever had to take care of an elderly parent, you know that sometimes that can take a fair amount out of you. And I've got some good people to help me, but you know, I really just didn't need or want her to be in the hospital yesterday while I was here. I didn't really want to have to think about that. I didn't want to have to try to deal with that in between. And I'm making all these phone calls and trying to tell everybody what to do. And thank God my girls were doing a great job. But you know what? I can't waste the energy I've got getting upset about something I can't do anything about. So here's what I've learned to say. You know what? It is what it is. It is what it is. And we will deal with it one day at a time. Come on now, I want you to learn that today. It is what it is, and we're going to deal with it one day at a time. See, I've learned over the long haul that God gives us the grace to do whatever we need to do. If, and only if, and don't miss the if, we keep a good attitude. Now, if you don't keep a good attitude, you can forget getting much of God's help. How many of you need a little attitude adjustment this morning? All right. Now, you know, I'm, I'm like, I used to be a control freak. And so, I was always like, I'm not going to put up with that. I'm going to change that. I'm going to do something. I'm going to tell you. I got any relatives here? And I'm just here to tell you that if God can change me, God can change anybody. Because I had a bad case. Amen? Well, I would look at that sign in my grandmother's house, and here I had this huge secret in me that my dad was abusing me, and I didn't know what to do about it. And somehow or another, I would look at that sign, God grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And somehow or another, I drew strength from that. And even as a little girl, I made a decision. I can't do anything about this, but I'm going to survive it. I knew I couldn't change it, but I knew I could survive it. I knew that. And so I just made plans that the day that I was old enough, I would get out of that house and I can even remember laying in my bed as a teenager thinking, someday I'm going to do something great. Because my father had always told me I'd never amount to anything, and that just made me mad. Now, I received Christ when I was nine years old, and I will say that I don't believe I would have had that determination had I not received Christ into my life. You see, when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and you don't receive weakness and wimpiness and inability and can't. You receive ability, efficiency, might, power. But as I shared with you this morning, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 1 that he prayed for the church that they would know and understand the power that was available to them as believers. I want you to understand today that you've got what it takes. Whatever you have to deal with in life, you've got what it takes. And you need to renew your mind to that and stop thinking that you can't because as long as you think you can't everything that comes along is going to overwhelm you and defeat you everybody say I've got what it takes what it amen we can have the courage 
to wait on God and enjoy where we're at on the way to where we're going. Matthew 19, 26 says, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, one of the things that I cannot do is change myself. And boy, that brought a lot of frustration into my life. I wanted to change me. I wanted to change Dave. I wanted to change my kids. I wanted to make my ministry grow. I wanted more money than what I had. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted. Only I didn't know how to be happy while I was waiting. So I just kept trying to do something that I couldn't do. As long as you're trying to do something that you can't do, you are going to be one thing and one thing only, and that is frustrated. Amen? And I would venture to say that probably we've got more people in here that experience more frustration than you do peace. I'm not saying you never have peace, but you're probably frustrated a lot. You're frustrated because you're in works of the flesh. You're trying to do something that only God can do. Now, I cannot change myself, but I can cooperate with the Holy Spirit while He's changing me. Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now, not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, this is Paul talking to them, but much more because I am absent, work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, with self-distrust, with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. Now, I'm already tired after reading that. Work out your own salvation. Resist temptation. Do this. Do that. Do something else. Do something else. Well, we know that, we're, that we can't change ourselves, so what in the world is he talking about? Then, he get, then we get it. Not in your own strength. Not in your own strength. For it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and the desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, the good news is, is even if you want to change, God is the one who put that desire in you. And he's the only one that can give you the courage to keep doing what you need to do until you see that change come to pass. And he is the only one that can give you the courage to be happy where you're at on the way to where you're going. So I want you to begin to pray, God, grant me the courage to change what I can change. But grant me the courage to accept what I cannot change. And grant me the courage to be happy where I'm at on the way to where I'm going. Life is short. Compared to eternity, life is short. And we need to not waste our days being miserable about something we can't do anything about. Amen? It is what it is. Well, it certainly does take courage to change things. If God's trying to work with us to change us, that takes courage. If there's a circumstance in our life that God is leading us to change, that takes courage. But you know, it also takes courage to accept what you cannot change and maintain a good attitude while you're waiting for God to do what only God can do. You know, Philippians 1, 6 promises us that God has begun a good work in us and that He will complete it and bring it to fulfillment in our lives. But we do have times of waiting and we have special times of really working with the Holy Spirit to let Him have His way in our life. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full 
the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded and he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident, and when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now, and so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. Het leven is te kort om te verspillen. Trek jezelf uit de sleur. Word actief en maak er iets van. Ontdek de bestemming voor jouw leven en wat God voor jou in petto heeft. Joyce Meyer heeft hierover een boek geschreven. Ik daag je uit. Ontdek, ga de uitdaging aan en bestel het boek via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed, het is het waard.